it's amazing to me when I think about the details of you know, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you know, as you just said, you know, knowledge that even Robert McNamara didn't have at the time of um, what the Cubans possessed and when. And given the fallibility of human nature and the the poor judgment of uh, you know world leadership, it's it's incredible to me that there hasn't been already more um nuclear exchanges since the end of the second world war and i, I guess i would uh, it, you know it, before we move on to the primary subject of the conversation how do you think about the the odds that we can really continue with this um you know largely success in not um blowing up the entire world you know the, you, you i know you have a family um i think you have grandkids how do you think about that? Do you think there's a fighting chance that we can we can continue to not use these devastating technologies and not actually eliminate all of global civilization? Well, I wish I were confident, but I'm afraid I'm not because what no one knew during the Cuban Missile Crisis and for many years thereafter was the phenomenon of nuclear winter. Uh, this really didn't become clear until some studies that Carl Sagan and other scientists were doing of, of all things, dust storms on Mars, mm. where, where the dust storms cover the whole planet sometimes and blot out the minimal sunlight that Mars gets anyway and drop the temperature on the surface of that planet 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees in a matter of weeks. When those scientists realized started thinking about what a nuclear war would do. They thought about all the burning cities with all the combustible materials. They thought about all the burning forests with all the combustible materials. And they did some calculations and realized that a nuclear winter from a full scale nuclear exchange in this world would reduce a average annual temperature by 20 degrees for 10 or 15 years at least because of the smoke and the soot and the uh, uh, not nitrous oxides that would the smog that would get into the atmosphere. They were horrified and they published several papers on it in the late 1980s with a predictable response from right wingers like Edward Teller that, oh, they're wrong. But, but they've tested this the theory out in many different ways, particularly now because they have much better atmospheric models from looking at global warming. And the latest study, which was done in 2007, reviewing those earlier uh, results using a much simplified atmospheric model, they found it would be even worse than they thought before. Then they decided, well, let's take a look at what a little regional war would look like, a little regional war. India and Pakistan exchanging each 50 warheads exploded over the cities of those two countries. 100 bombs, total yield of one and a half megatons, less than some of the weapons we have in our stockpile. And they discovered to their horror that a sort of modified nuclear winter would occur with an average temperature drop around the world from that smoke slowly drifting worldwide of about two to three degrees, which doesn't sound like much, but it turns out it would be enough to to basically kill a lot of agriculture. So they calculated that the prompt destructiveness of the weapons killing Indians and Pakistanis would be about 20 million deaths. But the effect of this sort of modified nuclear winter would be up to 2 billion deaths. So even a small regional nuclear war, which people used to sotto voce say to themselves, well, maybe there'll be a little nuclear war and that will convince the rest of us to get rid of our weapons. Oh no, we're very much deep in the frying pan. So. On the one hand, I would like to think that this gradual squeeze play by diplomacy and by the non-nuclear nations of the world is going to eventually force the nuclear powers to, to change their attitude about nuclear weapons. But I don't know if we have the time. There were something like 13 near misses during the Cold War, times when we came within hours of a nuclear exchange. The one that I always remember was in 1983 during the Reagan era when there had been a lot of hostility back and forth because Reagan was 
doubling the defense budget and building more weapons and so forth. Uh, we had an annual autumn field exercise with NATO in Europe where all the troops came out and worked out and tried to use their machines and so forth. This particular year, it was one of the years when they also brought heads of state in to practice making the decision to go nuclear. <laughs> and Andropov was the head of the Soviet Union at the time, former head of the KGB. He was pretty paranoid. And when he saw this, this was a classic way Soviet Union always went to war, as we saw it recently in, in uh, uh, I'm blocking on the name, oh, Ukraine, of course. Yep. Yep. They, they pretend they're having a military exercise and that gets them in position, and then they move on to a full-scale attack. That's exactly what he thought was happening from NATO's side. And he was scrambling planes in East Germany with nuclear weapons aboard. It was, uh, they were doing things like checking on the, whether people were stockpiling a lot of blood supplies at hospitals in Washington. Their diplomats were going out seeing if people were buying and selling a lot of blood. I mean, that's that's the way they were. So he was ready to, to, to beat us to the punch. But of course, our punch was mere practice and his would not have been. Mm -hmm. And it was only when Reagan heard about this scrambling of aircraft that he said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and had everything, everybody stand down and sent a message to Moscow saying, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. That the whole thing was, was slowed down. It was after that, not long after that, that Reagan spoke to the UN and coined the phrase, uh, nuclear war could never be won and must never be fought. Mm. But that kind of thing happened a lot, many more than I think we have ever been told from what I've heard from government people. So it's not as if we're out of the frying pan, we're very much still in it and will be until such a time as we can get a handle and walk back the delivery time on all these weapons.